Yep, cool. So if each panelist going from Jorge I can just say their name quickly. My name is Jorge Ortiz. I am Paul Snively. Rod Johnson. James Douglas. E.T. Cole. Brian McKenna. Fantastic. We got Test, James. Microphone. All right. Cool. Yep. So, can you, can you see anything here? So, the, see, when the sound goes, this little bar just jumps. Okay, cool. All right. So, we're going to start. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is uh, a special San Francisco Scala meetup. I think one of the most special events we've done through mostly three years of our existence. So welcome everybody. Uh, we're in Kabam and Michael Morana, director of engineering here, is really uh, the person who pushed for us to be here. This is our first meetup here. This is a fantastic venue. This is an old Twitter office and IT was actually uh, working here when she was at Twitter. Uh, it's centrally located, it's uh, beautiful views, company, they're enthusiastic about Scala, a bunch of the team members are here, so we really are grateful and happy to be here. Um, and uh, a few words how this whole thing uh, came about. Uh, in, uh, in June they had the Scala Days conference, it's a type safe yearly conference which quickly became a flagship conference for Scala. And uh, essentially all the people from San Francisco flew to New York to meet there. Uh, and, uh, and Rod uh, gave a keynote uh, which uh, stirred a lot of debate and caused a lot of thinking, which is a sign of a, of a great keynote. Uh, and essentially, uh, if I can sort of paraphrase, the, the meaning is Scala increases. Uh, we should be careful with uh, various complex issues, uh, if I may say so, and essentially be mindful of, of various techniques uh, in widespread usage today. Uh, and that basically caused a lot of responses from the Scala community, but they not necessarily were all in a kind of a productive fashion, that there were a lot of tweets and kind of uh, snide remarks, but uh, we never had a conversation about this. Right? We actually never had a forum where we can collectively think of the future of Scala, and uh, uh, I think we should all thank Rod for stating the, the title of his keynote, the original keynote, you know, looking a few years ahead, and I think it's really useful for all of us to do that, so basically we called this panel the same, the same uh, title to really focus on, on where, what is the goal of all of this, right? Because in, in five years, the world will change, uh, a lot of new companies will be born, we already see from uh, San Francisco startup scene that a lot of them are so it's inevitable that huge companies will be born like Twitter and grow very quickly, which you know happened in the time frame of five years, right? And Scala will be underneath, and thousands of developers will be working on them. A lot of them will learn Scala in the years to come. So it's it's all very uh, relevant questions, and this forum is meant as a discussion where we can actually. Uh, come together as a Scala community and talk with Rod about, about the future. And he has a lot of very relevant experience and basically he took a lot of this industry to, to new heights. And uh, he definitely his addition to the types of work is very valuable and we can all learn basically from, from, from that. Uh, so at the same time, uh, there was a lot of controversy uh, and uh, disagreement on, on, on a lot of specifics. And, People have strong opinions, so basically we'll have, we'll have a format to, to discuss all of that. So that's the preliminary. Uh, the plan for the evening is Mike is going to tell us about Kabam and uh, tell you a bit more about the facilities, right? It's a huge audience, so you should know about all, all the amenities available. And after that, we'll jump straight to Mike. Thank you very much. So I'm Michael Morano. Uh, Thank you so much uh, to Alexi and Jason for organizing the meetup. Uh, I know Alexi put a lot of work into like the Scala 
the Silicon Valley Scala Symposium, which was fantastic. I think we've got a really great community here. So Kabam is most well known for our mobile and social games. Um, I work on the distribution engineering team, a team of about 20 engineers, uh, working on the core web services for our account systems and our mobile SDKs. Uh, we've got existing APIs, which we've been using. We've been using Java. We've been using Ruby. And over the last two months, we've started to build up our web services on Scala and Play. Um, so we're definitely new to the space. We're excited to be involved. And we're always looking for people to help us out. So if you're interested in working at Kabam, come talk to Kabamers. We've got a whole ton of people here for us, our recruiters here. But that's the end of the plug. Um, <laughs> uh, tactics for the evening. So piles of pizza, please eat all the pizza. Beer is over there. Feel free to drain the kegs. If you don't drink beer, there's refrigerators over there with other drinks. Restrooms are out in the lobby around the corner. If you guys need anything, come grab any fr anybody from Kabam tonight. Thanks a ton. All right. All right. Thanks, Mike. So the uh, structure of this panel uh, will be pretty fixed in the beginning, and then we'll uh, uh, loosened up a little bit and play by ear. So first, Rod is going to recap, essentially, his keynote for, for those of us who didn't get a chance to, to see it in its entirety. Uh, and uh, then each of the panelists will basically state their response and state their vision for Scala in view of these questions. Uh, so we know, basically, uh, where everybody uh, stands. And, it, and I'll ask you guys to introduce yourselves. I think everybody's uh, pretty known in the Scala and Java community, but you know, if you can just sort of introduce yourself again and recap a little bit uh, uh, your Scala biography, it will be great. Uh, and then uh, uh, formulate your response. Uh, so that will be the first part. Uh, so based on this and the set of questions which we collected on the uh, Meetup uh, website, uh, I will ask each of you uh, a question. Uh, to clarify your positions, right? And, and all of this will be timed. So Rod has up to 10 minutes. Every other panelist has up to three minutes. Uh, the questions, <laughs> uh, the, because we'll be asking, uh, all asking Rod, so we need to know, you know his, uh, his uh, position in, in uh, a lot of detail. Uh, so when the second part, each of the panelists will ask Rod a question. We'll have up to 30 seconds for the question and up to two minutes for Rod's response, right? So, uh, and the panelists do not have to use all this time. We'll have the timer going, uh, but it, it's an upper limit. Uh, and short questions are fine and short answers are fine. Uh, and, uh, and basically, after that, we'll have the segment for the audience questions. So I encourage everybody to uh, either prepare the question and think it through when we go around with the mic or and or uh, tweet with the hashtag Scala2018, which is here on the screen. And I'll be picking this up. And Jason, our amazing organizer, who is a referee, he is the time maestro. He will be managing the time. And he has various tools in his arsenal to enforce this. Uh, and uh, he and Mike will help me with the questions. Uh, from the audience, and uh, in the end, uh, we'll have a free forum discussion uh, among the panelists. So that's that's the plan. So, Jason, please ring in the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I think More we can pull it like this. Let's do it again. All right. There you awesome. go. So, Rod, uh, now the floor is yours. Please uh, tell us. Uh, uh, the uh, summary of your um, message, uh, which you uh, gave us a couple of days. Thanks, uh, Alexi. Actually, before I start, I have a question. At what point do we have the congressional vote? And are we going to go to the UN Security Council? <laughs> <laughs> I think that depends on the proceedings. OK. OK. So well, thank you very much um, for coming tonight. I do hope the, you know, some of you aren't waiting with baseball bats outside. I sometimes, <laughs> sometimes wonder from Twitter. But you know, seriously, I think it is fantastic for, you know, as a sign of the health of the Scala community that people are so passionate about Scala and so many people want to talk about Scala. I mean, it kind of sucks for the people who couldn't come along tonight because the event was full. Um, but you know, it's great to see so many people here. So you know. 
there has been an interesting reaction, I think it's fair to say, to my talk. And, you know, maybe I should have spoken about something less contentious, like chemical weapons in Syria or gun ownership, um, because there may have been a little bit less passion. Um, but seriously, you know, I'd like to start by saying that I think in terms of the big picture, I would hope that everyone on the panel and everyone in the audience is on the same side. I passionately want Scala to succeed. I really, really love programming in Scala. As I mentioned in my talk in New York, I get more joy out of programming in Scala than I have out of programming in any language since C. C is not a language that I would choose to write code in every day because frankly, we have evolved in terms of levels of abstraction and paradigms. But you know, with writing code in C, I just always thought that it was perfectly elegant. If you wanted to write procedural code, C gave you a beautifully elegant way of doing just that. And you know, Java and C++, I, I wrote quite a bit of Java. Um, I like Java, but I never, I never felt exactly that. You know, as an object-oriented language, Java was okay, but you know, no one would seriously argue that it was the most perfect or elegant expression you could have of those concepts. Whereas with Scala, I think that it truly is beautiful. If you look at the way it mixes the paradigms, if you look a lot at a lot of the little details in the language, it's, you know, I think it's truly, truly beautiful. I would also say that um, I think, in distinction to um, some people um, in the community, and frankly, in distinction to some people I highly respect, I am very much a practical kind of guy. And I make, you know, I don't apologize for that. I mean, essentially, I think that software engineering is fundamentally about people rather than uh, programming languages. And you know, I think it is a valid matter of debate whether that's correct. Um, but you know, that is definitely the viewpoint that I'm coming from. So some of the major points, I don't want to recap the entire talk, but some of the major points that I made was that I think that Scala is on the brink of becoming a really mainstream language. I think Scala really is breaking away from what you might call the second tier languages. And I think it's a really, really exciting moment for Scala as a programming language and therefore for those of us in the Scala community. So that actually reflects one of my biases, that I think it would be really good if Scala becomes mainstream. I think it would be really, really good if lots and lots and lots of people use Scala. And there is actually a valid argument that that is not the way that Scala should go. That Scala should be something that you know, is frankly more of a niche, but you know, perhaps um, maybe what some people would consider a more elegant niche. So you know, I, I think that is a debatable point. But I am coming pretty, pretty uh, strongly from the viewpoint that it is really good for things to be used very, very widely for a number of reasons. One reason is that if something is good, you really want people to benefit from it. So if you think something is truly fantastic, I think it is great to take that to as many people who can benefit from it as possible. Secondly, I think that things that do not expand to a large community and potentially a very large community eventually do die. Everything dies in the end. But the things that live longest are the things that really have gotten to mainstream acceptance. So if you love something, but there really aren't an enormous number of people using it, it's more likely to go away. Uh, and that you know, is definitely one of my motivations. Some of my more controversial points were my assessment of what I believe to be some of the issues holding Scala back from that kind of mainstream acceptance. And also some of my observations about Java. So you know, I started by talking about a few more or less randomly chose, chosen reasons of why Java sucks. And you know, that obviously went down, goes down pretty well <laughs> in, in the community. But then I actually talked about some of the reasons that Java has become very pro popular and why. Frankly, there are things about Java that really, really don't suck. 
So, for example, there is the fact that Java has exceptional, an exceptionally good story on backward compatibility. We don't. And that actually, in that, it's been intriguing that in terms of the reaction, or rather the more negative end of the spectrum of reaction to my talk, that has not been discussed at all. And certainly, both in my opinion and from a lot of people that I speak to, uh, that seems to be a major issue. Another thing that I think Java doesn't suck at is tooling support. Scala tooling is getting there. Java tooling is truly awesome. And it's not, you know, it is not a question of like, I believe someone commented about the event about, well, of course Java needs tooling because of all the XML files. I'm not going to mention Spring tonight besides the fact that really heavy use of XML hasn't been recommended in Spring for about four years. I, I do think that I should break that. Um, but, but, you know, the fact is it's not just a workaround to the deficiencies of Java. Java at the end of the day is a language that you can build tooling for. Yes, it has a strong model. It's relatively type safe. Scala is a language you could build even better tooling for because it's got a stronger model. And it's a matter of time, and it's also possibly a matter of slowing down the moving target that is Scala so the tooling can catch up. One of the more contentious that I mentioned was... So I think there's two parts to this. The first part is the question of whether it's good for code to be easily readable. So for example, if someone can't read your code, if that's your fault or it's their fault. I frankly think that if someone finds it hard to read your code, that often is the fault of the person who wrote the code. There is a second very legitimate debate about what constitutes readable code. And I certainly would not claim to have the monopoly of wisdom on that. In fact, I would not claim to be anywhere near the wisest person in this room on that. But I think it's a very, very important debate. And my personal observation is that because of the proliferation of different possibilities and different styles that exist in Scala, uh, there does tend to be more of an issue. And I mean, this is, this is not something that I plucked out of the air. This is something that I've heard from a number of companies that I'm personally associated with, and it's something that I've heard from a lot of people more broadly, that they worry about the mix of styles and the fact that there isn't always such a uh, priority on um, readable code. Another perhaps content, well, definitely contentious point was that I don't think object orientation is bad. In fact, I think that Scala has been described by its creator as a modern object-oriented language that has first-class support for functional programming. And I do think that there is a bit of a current in the, some elements of the community about viewing object-oriented programming as a second-class citizen. And I, I think that personally does not reflect uh, what Scala is. This definitely shouldn't be taken to mean that I dislike functional programming. I think functional programming is very valuable. I think there are fine languages purely devoted to functional programming. But I think Scala is essentially a hybrid. So you know, I definitely um, do not mean to give the impression that I dislike functional programming. Some of the other points I made were essentially about the community, that I feel that there is an assumption that the Scala community knows best. And that, you know, if you look, for example, in particular at the Java community, that the great unwatched Java folk basically don't know very much. It's not my personal observation. And I do think that when we look at other communities, and particularly the Java community, most of our future recruits are going to come from, we actually should take a slightly more respectful look. And I do believe that the point that's been made that perhaps I was not sufficiently respectful of what's been done in the Scala community, that's a very, very fair point. And it is something that, you know, frankly, I should have made clearer in the, um, in the talk, that I am actually respectful of a lot of that has been accomplished in um, the Scala community. So essentially what I was trying to do is open a debate on how Scala can get to being 
a mainstream language that's extremely widely used and is going to live, frankly, um, for decades. And I, I think that is the most important debate in Scala right now. Thank you, Rod. It's perfect timing. Uh, we have the timers going here. Uh, they are basically guides for the panelists. We, you know, prefer that you keep inside the bounds, but if you make a very important point, don't, you know, don't be afraid to run over a bit. So uh, now uh, we'll just go uh, left to right. Uh, start with Jorge. Uh, so please introduce yourself, and uh, and then uh, formulate your response to to Rod's uh, keynote and and today's uh, recap of that. Uh, we have for all the panelists they are. Uh, Twitter handles and GitHub accounts on the Meta page. I think uh, folks know most of the panelists very well, uh, but it will still be useful to hear, you know, your little story from from yourself. Uh, so my name is Jorge Ortiz. I'm a software engineer at Foursquare. Uh, I've been at Foursquare for about three years. Uh, Foursquare has been using Scala extensively for that entire time. Uh, when I started, we had like five engineers writing Scala full time. Now we have like 80 engineers writing Scala full time. Uh, so we've definitely like sort of seen the team grow and the code base grow. Uh, the vast majority of the engineers that we've hired have had no prior experience whatsoever with Scala. Uh, so so we've gotten a pretty good sense of like, you know, how do you take programmers that have never been exposed to Scala before and like dump them into a very large uh, Scala code base? We have, I last time I counted, I think we had like 600,000 lines of Scala. Uh, in our code base, uh, dump them into a very large Scala code base, and like, you know, do they, can they work well? How do they find the language? What are their stumbling blocks? Um, before Foursquare, I worked at LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn at the time was like a 95% Java shop uh, with, you know, a few hundred engineers, uh, and they were they were sort of slowly adopting Scala for like, you know, a handful of teams were looking at Scala for, you know, a handful of projects. Uh, I think now LinkedIn has sort of like jumped, you know, pretty pretty deeply into Scala, and they've a lot of their core infrastructure is based on Scala. Uh, a lot of their web web stuff is being rewritten in Scala, um, and so that was that was a different perspective of like a large Java organization sort of like transitioning to uh, to Scala. Uh, so I think I've gotten like, and before LinkedIn, I was sort of like using Scala for my own projects, not necessarily at a large company. Uh, and, and so I, I feel like I've gotten like a, a good sense of like you know using Scala as a hobbyist, using Scala in an organization that went from you know massive Java code base to like being pretty uh, pretty big on Scala adoption to an organization that started off as 100% Scala uh, and, and and grew very large. Um, and so my my reaction to to Rod's uh, talk, um, I think there are some areas in which we like we very much agree. I think there are. Uh, some areas in which we have like very different assumptions about, you know, what's going on, uh, and I think there's some areas where we like fundamentally disagree, and I want to go through through each of those. Uh, so areas where I think we we very much agree, um, compile times. I think he he mentioned in his Scala days talk that you know the Scala compiler needs to be faster, uh, and that is the number one biggest problem that we have run into at Foursquare is when you have you know 80 engineers recompiling. 600,000 lines of Scala all day long, uh, it, it takes a very, very long time to compile. Uh, and, you know, there's, we've, we've spent a lot of effort sort of like mitigating the, the problems of Scala compile times. Uh, but it is, you know, orders of magnitude slower than the Java compiler, than the Go compiler, than a lot of other compilers. Uh, so that's definitely like one of the, one of the biggest areas I think that, that Scala could improve in. Uh, another thing that I think I agree with Rod on is that uh, tooling support needs to get better. The IDEs need to be better. There needs to be buggers, uh, refactoring tools, style enforcement tools, uh, sort of like find bugs in software. I think there's there's all sorts of things where uh, Java tooling is far ahead of where uh, Scala tooling is, and and these are sort of like important for for companies that uh, that run on on Scala. Um, I also agree with Rod that that Scala sort of uh, lets you lets you code in a variety of styles. Um, you can treat it as like Java with you know fewer type annotations. You can treat it as Haskell with more type annotations. You can treat it as like you know Ruby. You can treat it as like anywhere in like this you know multi-dimensional space of styles. Um, and and I think different uh, different 
organizations and different open source projects have converged on sort of like different areas of this style space. Uh, and there's, uh, there isn't a lot of agreement as to what constitutes good Scala style. Um, and, and I think sort of being able to, um, being able to like codify, uh, maybe not like one style guide for everyone to agree on, but, but at least sort of like a small number of them for, for different communities to agree on. I think that would be very useful. Um, uh, I also agree very much with him about not reinventing wheels that have, uh, sort of like if there's a good Java library that does something and it does it well and it has, you know, 10 years of experience in production and, you know, fixed a lot of bugs and addressed a lot of issues, uh, there's no there's no need to reinvent that in Scala. Uh, and I think sort of like one of the places in which the, the sort of the Scala open source community has done very poorly here is with JSON libraries. There's like six different Scala JSON libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them are buggy in different particular ways uh, and, and it's just like they don't interoperate with each other they don't uh, they're not very none of them are very performant uh, the situation in Java land isn't that much better but but there are sort of like you know solid Java libraries that at least do like JSON parsing very very quickly and very very well uh, and you know everyone in Scala seems to want to reinvent their own parser for JSON and that's you know probably totally unnecessary um, and, and I also agree that the JVM is Scala's greatest strength. I think uh, to the extent that, Java, that Scala has been successful, it is because it has uh, integrated very well with the JVM, which has sort of, you know, thousands and thousands of man years of, uh, of you know, engineering effort poured into it to make it like a, a great solid VM. It's like much better than, than basically any other, any other virtual machine for any other programming language out there. Um, and so that's the that's the stuff where I think we I, I agree with you. Uh, the things where I think we have like very different assumptions about about uh, about things is um, uh, I think you know you your your stance very much assumes that the popularity is good that the more people use Scala the the better that is. Um, and I think I don't know if I agree or I disagree, but I think that I I don't sort of automatically assume that. Um, I think. Uh, Java has been extremely popular, and that is a source of a lot of its success. But I also think that the vast majority of Java programmers are not people that I would want to work with. Um, and so, in, in sort of like a very selfish way, I want Scala to be this like this niche of people that are that are really really good at what they do. Um, and and if I'm hiring for a Scala position, then I don't have to worry that I'm going to get flooded with a bunch of resumes of you know, people that can string enterprise Java beans together but have no idea how a computer works. Um, and, and, and maybe that's a little snobbish, uh, uh, and it probably is, uh, but, but I like that aspect of Scala. Um, I think another assumption is that enterprise, uh, another, assumption you, another assumption you make is that enterprise is good. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of room for debate there. Um, I think uh, you know, Google is a huge user of, of Java for, you know, for a bunch of their backend software. Um, and they have totally rejected all of the, you know, J2EE, all of Spring, all of, like, all of the, like, enterprise Java things. Um, and they've, you know, basically settled on, you know, the core of J2SE. They've even, like, ignored a lot of the libraries. They've built their own standard library for Java. Um, and, and they've taken that and, you know, then they're, they really love Java. I think, you know, Google is very, very committed to, to working with Java. Um, but, uh, but they've very much rejected all the enterprise side of Java. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, there's something to that where uh, a lot of the enterprise stuff that has gone into Java is not great. Um, and um, and the, the core of the Java language is, is really beautiful and elegant in some ways. Like it, it, uh, it's a, the JVM is like a very, you know, clear programming model. It has a, it has a memory model, which is like, you know, first of its kind kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Java sort of like maps very much like one-to-one -one onto the JVM. Uh, and so it's very elegant in some ways, but I think a lot of the ecosystem that evolved around enterprise Java was not very great. Um, and I think that another one of the assumptions that, that you make in your talk is that uh, the the visible parts of the community are the majority of the community, uh, and I think that's not the case at all. I think that 
uh, the people that you like the the stuff that you see in blog posts and on the mailing list and on the IRC channel represent like a very small percentage of the actual Scala code that's getting written. Uh, and if you talk to people that are using Scala at work, you're going to see a much wider perspective um, than than what is like sort of evident uh, in uh, in sort of like the the very vocal community. Um, and I think I'm out of time, but I'm going to say one more thing, um, and, and that is I think that what I fundamentally fundamentally disagree with you about. Uh, about the talk that you gave is that it sounded very prescriptive. It sounded very much like uh, the Scala community should do this or the Scala community should do that, um, and we need to like you know work towards a common style and we need to uh, do all these things. Um, and I think I think that approach of telling other people how to write their Scala code uh, is just going to be very unpopular. Uh, and I think the right way to approach the the problem of like if you want Scala to be popular in the enterprise or you want Scala to be popular among this like community that has not yet adopted Scala, uh, I think the right way to do that is is not by prescribing current Scala users on how they should use Scala, uh, but by leading the way, right? So like publishing a style guide, uh, sort of, you know, uh, setting like setting best practices, sort of, uh, you know, publishing libraries that, uh, that you know, use the, the the Java libraries that you think shouldn't, you know, are solid and, and aren't re and and aren't reinventing the wheel, right? So like leading the way for people that uh, that want to use Scala in the way that you envision people using Scala, uh, and I think that is that is uh, a better and a probably more fruitful approach than than trying to to sort of like you know hurt all the cats that are currently using Scala and make them go in the direction that you want to go because I think that's that's kind of not really going to happen. Um, and that's more than I have time for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for her. Uh, now uh, on to Paul. Well, um, Rod has has made the job of debating him extraordinarily difficult uh, with his synopsis, which I suppose is only fair after he's made it so much easier to be a Java developer uh, for the last, uh, you know, over a decade, right? So the first thing I'd like to do is thank Rod for Spring, actually. Um, you know, made my job so much easier as a Java developer for many, many, many years. Um, I really don't don't have a, a lot to offer by way of debate. Um, so let me just, if I can, make a couple of, of observations, uh, offer a couple of opinions of my own. Um, one is that what it means to be an enterprise application, I think, is different today. Uh, than it has been at, at uh, any time in the past decade plus. I think... Um okay, Chris. Sorry, we're just adjusting your levels, Paul. Hello? Maybe we should use the hand mic. I've got the hand mic here. Why don't we just go to that? Okay. Okay. Let's try this. Okay. Thank you. Um, to to be an enterprise application now has has challenges around the the quantity and quality of data. Um, I think that you have to deal with that have evolved over time. Uh, Rod is over here nodding his head. Uh, so. Um, most people are going to be exposed to the need for some form of machine learning um, as they proceed developing applications for even the most mainstream of uh, enterprises, uh, I think, at this point. Uh, I think everybody understands now that blocking I.O., uh, shared state concurrency, um, you know, the, these kinds of things are, are part of the problem set, not part of the solution set, no matter what language uh, you happen to be working in. So one of my propositions is that um, it takes new languages and new frameworks to address new requirements even in the mainstream enterprise. Uh, and then a second observation or opinion that I would offer is I'm not convinced that having a bifurcated or more fragmented 
community using a language is necessarily a bad thing. Um, for example, the C++ community is pretty firmly divided into the C with classes camp and the boost camp, uh, and that doesn't seem to have damaged uh, the C++ community uh, all that much. And I would suggest that for the Scala community to have similar subcultural divisions, if you will, uh, is not necessarily harmful um, to the Scala community as well. You can just sit down and ho uh, hold it for next time. Uh, and now, thanks, Paul. Uh, James? So we'll see if my mic lasts. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm James Douglas. And first of all, I want to say that this is super awesome to be up here with all you guys. I feel like uh, I'm in your shadow. Um, and I'm just honored to be in this panel with everyone here. Um, so I think I, like like many of the people here and many of the people uh, at Scala Days who saw uh, your keynote, Rod, uh, got into Scala as uh, something of a Java refugee. Uh, so I started my career uh, you know, as a Java programmer, and then I moved into sort of the enterprise um, Java space, uh, building EJBs at first on things like Oracle WebSphere or IBM WebSphere or whatever. Um, and then uh, I read both your books and, and moved away from EJBs, which was wonderful, and, and got to adopt Spring. Uh, and ended up using that for sev uh, several years um, at multiple companies, consulting and um, and so forth. Uh, and so I've seen it work really well, um, especially with big teams of uh, beginning engineers. Uh, and then in the last few years, I've discovered Scala, and that's kind of opened up this entire new world to me. So I, you know, my my history was very much in this OO slash kind of procedural shaped. Um, uh, world and and now uh, you know not having a math background uh, I'm learning about things like functional programming and category theory and so forth um, and I'm finding that it's really affecting the way that uh, I think about computing and, and that I write code um, and uh, such that at any given point in time if I look back at code that I've written just a few months ago I think like wow I'm not going back to that way like mm. no way um, so it seems like for me uh, Scala has been uh, uh, because it has this sort of OO functional uh, hybrid model, uh, it's going to be very difficult. Um, you know, one of the things you talked about was um, uh, kind of coming up with uh, idiomatic uh, or, or style guide prescriptions, as Jorge put it, uh, that we want to sort of steer the community toward. And uh, you mentioned that most of the people uh, currently using Scala make up very much the minority that you expect to see uh, in the next five years. So, um, so I can I can kind of see how uh, having sort of a standardized um, best practices or, or sort of style guide would be, you know, handy for bringing people in and kind of Scala is and how to write code in Scala. But uh, based on my own experience, it seems like the things that brought me into Scala are completely different from the things that are keeping me there. So it's kind of nice uh, that there is such a wide a range of styles that are possible in Scala. And I think that's um, one of the things that has made it successful so far and uh, uh, I think gives it a lot of value. Um, that's also going to uh, make it very difficult um, you know, to come up with any kind of single standardized style to prescribe to people. And I think um, Jorge was mentioning uh, the uh, proliferation of JSON parsers. and. Uh, you know, they're all buggy and you don't want to use any one of them in particular. Um, how uh, do, uh, you know, each one of them is a different style. And so it's, it's kind of interesting to look at uh, where I am in my own uh, progression through, you know, my learning of Scala and, and watching my uh, approach to programming change. Uh, these different libraries will actually appeal to me at different times. And so, I can see the inherent complexity in this, especially when you have a team of people who are learning Scala or maybe uh, have more. There, there will be a tendency to move in kind of different stylistic directions. Uh, it sort of seems like a, uh, the debate is hot and it keeps uh, the, the room for improvement and the room for uh, discovering new things um, uh, you know, very wide open. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, I, I wanted to mention was, uh, you know, we're talking about um, Scala in 2018 becoming a mainstream language, uh, and you mentioned that your love for Scala is part of what motivates that. You want it to, you want, don't want to see it die, and you want to see it uh, have the same sort of adoption um, 
or some subset of the adoption that Java saw, uh, even if it can't quite get to where Java got, uh, just so that it can live on and we can still program in this um, uh, very robust language. Um, but actually, I, I wonder if that's actually necessary uh, for Scala's success. Uh, as it is, I find Scala um, you know, very useful for the, the code that I write at, at, at my company. Um, and I think a lot of people find uh, the same thing to be true. Um, and furthermore, the, the pattern that I followed, um, sort of entering Scala with a very Java-oriented uh, mind frame uh, and kind of graduating to functional programming, not, not that one is necessarily uh, uh, objectively better than the other, but that's sort of the path that I've taken and that's where my preferences are. Um, I think that's available right now to, to any engineer who wants to make that journey. So I sort of, I wonder if, uh, I, I guess I sort of agree that I, I would like to see Scala become mainstream, but maybe for a slightly different reason. I think the things that Scala has opened up for me, uh, I want every engineer to have that same kind of opportunity. Uh, and, you know, if Scala becomes more popular, fine. I don't, I, you know, I'm sort of indifferent um, from the languages uh, for the sake of the language, but I think that's a, a wonderful thing for engineers to have access to. Um, but, but as I said, I think it's already kind of in a place, it's, it has a strong enough community uh, already that, that we're kind of there. Uh, so I think uh, I still have plenty of time, but that, that's uh, most of my thoughts that, that, uh, that I'd open with. Thanks, James. Uh, I think Jason is putting way too much time. I think it should be just three minutes per panelist. So, uh, so uh, now on to IT. Hi everyone, I'm Iti. I'm an engineer at uh, Twitter. I work on the trends team at Twitter. Um, basically, my team is um, responsible for the architecture implementation and the product of trending topics at Twitter. And um, I've been working on Scala for the last couple of years. And before that, I was a purely Java programmer. So I've seen the switch as it happened, um, and I've delved into functional programming before um, um, during my school days. Uh, so when I started at Twitter, um, I came from a pu purely Java background. So it was interesting to see a paradigm shift that you almost make when you go from imperative style of coding to more functional style of coding. And uh, just going back to the thoughts that I think are resonating here as well, um, that it is very easy to, especially in a language like Scala, to code like Java, because it lets you do that. Um, so it's quite important, I think, uh, from what we've been talking about here, to um, also tell people how would you, what's the right way, what's the best way to do it. It's not that you're trying to put constraints on what they're developing and what they're implementing, but it's good to see um, what, how can I improve in what I'm doing. Um, I think Twitter recognized quite early, and we have Scala School at Twitter. Uh, this is open to all programs. They come from Ruby background, Java, C++. Um, and it's a way for them to see or um, work in a language that they don't um, generally work in. Um, when, when I did that, when I started um, programming in Scala, I found I became a better Java programmer. There were concepts that I could take from Scala and implement them in Java and realize, wow, there is uh, so much better way of doing this um, than I could have imagined. So um, the way I look at languages or um, new languages that you would pick up. It's um, more to do with opening your horizons. Um, if Scala is providing you a new way of thinking, you bring that back to a language which had not those constructs uh, available to it, or you didn't think that you could do things that way. Um, so, and having a community around that does give you that support. Um, why do people have Scala School? When do you think that a programming language has made it to mainstream? Do you have to have it offered in universities as classes? Um, do you think that a tooling support around languages is, is what makes it um, a mainstream lam 
mainstream language? Or uh, do you think that more and more open source projects are what makes a language mainstream? So there are all these things that I think we uh, put languages on a pedestal with. Um, is it offered in the community? Is it, does it have tooling support? Um, does it have open source support? Um, all of these things, if as a community um, we make an effort to bring people on board and say this is not scary, it's, uh, it will make you better as a programmer. It will only improve the language going forward, improve the community going forward. Um, yep. Thanks, That's Eddie. my thought. And now, Brian. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brian McKenna. I'm the third Australian on the panel. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Crikey. So I actually come to Scala from Haskell. Um, I'm one of the many people that come from Haskell. And um, I started working at a company called Precog, where we did a lot of purely functional Scala. Um, we recently got acquired about two months ago by a, co a company called Rich Relevance. So now I'm writing a lot of Java and trying to integrate Scala into the code base. And I can believe that I'm writing a lot of uh, purely functional Java. I have to do it. So um, I, I have to confess that I only watched Rod's keynote a couple of days ago. Um, I actually tried watching it about a month ago, but I couldn't bring myself to watch the whole thing. Um, I got to about halfway, and I couldn't finish it off. Um, basically, my problem was that it seemed like a big whine. Um, you were just kind of whinging about the Scala community and how it is at the moment. Um, and I'm for whinging. I, I do it all the time, check my Twitter. Um, but I, I didn't feel that it was very constructive. Also, I didn't, see, I didn't feel that it was very cohesive. It seemed really innocent. So, um, firstly, I just want to point out that I don't think that Scala becoming a mainstream language is important to me. I couldn't care less if it was mainstream or not. All I care about from a language is if I can write a program that does what I intend. That's it. Um, if, if, if people take a writing a program is a useful thing, then, um, then they can come in and join in. But uh, I, having a goal as becoming a mainstream language is not useful to me, personally. So um, if, I, if I really wanted a popular language, I'd just go use JavaScript. You only live once. Um, so secondly, um, the content of the keynote was that, um, that, um, that Rod says that um, the Scala community uh, needs to be more welcoming. And I did not get that from, from Rod's keynote. Um, Rod says that. Uh, functional programmers need to go somewhere else. That that doesn't make me feel welcome at all. Um, and going back, saying that need to be more welcoming, and then saying that, then going acting out people in the community that have been doing good things, and saying, look, this person is very naive because of this thing that he said. That's not very welcoming either. Um, but also, you said that code, the Scala code, is usually too clever. And I don't, I don't see how we can be naive and also too clever at the same time. Um, you know, if we need to stop writing clever code, we need to think about what the implications is by, by saying, saying that we can't write clever code. Does that mean we have to write ignorant code? And I, I, I can't write ignorant code, sorry. <laughs> um, when we see code that we think might be too clever, maybe we should think about it and say, well, maybe this code has been written like this for a reason. Um, maybe there's actually some benefits from understanding that this code is, 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 is doing something that I don't understand and that I actually have some learning to do. I might have to accept that I haven't stopped learning and that I need to learn some more, but that's what, that's what we should probably try and do, right? So, I'd, I'd, I mean, I'd, next time that you find some code that you think is too clever, maybe just try and figure out why it's written like that maybe try and figure out the implications of why it's written like that. Maybe um, you, you might find that intellectual purity isn't actually a thing, that there's actually benefits coming from writing code in a purely functional style. Um, you might find that writing elegant algorithms might actually help solve real world problems. Um, and maybe you'll even come to the same conclusion that I have, which is that functional programming is the most pragmatic way to, to write Scala. Thank you.
Thanks, Brian. So here we have uh, all the panelists' positions and, and right, so thank you for that. Uh, and now, uh, basically, the next segment, uh, each panelist will ask Rod a question. So Rod, I've seen you make a note, so you, uh, that's also your time to respond to every individual uh, panelist, if that works for you. I, I would like to respond to some of the, okay, the points sure. now. Sure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> sure. How, how long do I get? That works. <laughs> that works fine. Let, let's do that. So okay. basically, uh, if you'd like uh. to respond on uh, mass, so let's give you a segment of time just for that, and then we'll go go to the individual questions. I think um, I'm going to respond in two parts. Um, I'm going to respond to everyone else, and then I'm going to respond to Brian. Awesome. Uh, so <laughs> I, I know Australians <laughs> awesome. I mean, seriously, we say what we think. I think it's it's yeah. pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> where are you from? <laughs> uh, grew up in Brisbane. Oh, Sydney. So, yeah. um, I lived in Sydney for two years, didn't like it. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so to the, some of the other comments. Well, in fact, this is, this is actually a point that really comes out in actually what um, several people said, which is, does it matter whether something's mainstream? And, I mean, Brian put it more strongly. Um, and also with possibly an added little friss on of maybe it's cool if it's not mainstream because if it's not mainstream then you know essentially you don't get the people that write code you don't like coming into it i think that actually the question of google the issue of google was brought up and it's a really interesting issue google use java but they do use it in a way that certainly is not typical of so-called enterprise usage. But on the other hand, nor are Google's problems typical of the kind of problems that most enterprise class uh, companies have. One of the reasons that Google uses Java is obviously that Google grew up at the time when Java was utterly dominant. So you know, it's partly a generational thing that at that point, if you're going to write a Google, you're going to write it in Java. Secondly, they use Java because Java performs incredibly well. Why does Java perform incredibly well? You know what? Maybe the fact that Java is so mainstream is exactly why the JVM is such an awesome piece of code. You know, in fact, it's the fact that there are a whole lot of people using the parts of Java that, say, Google doesn't really care about um, and using various parts of the Java ecosystem that Google doesn't care about that enables Google to be Google. And I think that's a pretty good example of even if you are atypical, of a very large group of people that use a particular technology, you know what? You benefit from the fact that they, they use them. I mean, you know, Google um, essentially gets a, almost a free ride on the fact that, um, you know, Oracle, for example, considered Java important enough to put billions of dollars into it. Uh, well, obviously, Oracle's lawyers would argue that Google had got more of a free ride than that. But then <laughs> such litigation is evil, so we will not discuss it. Uh, so, you know, that is a fundamental, fundamental difference of opinion. Uh, that the idea that it doesn't matter if something's mainstream. And I am perfectly frank about the fact that I'm coming partly from a business perspective here, as well as a technology perspective. I don't think that, frankly, awesome as a Scala adoption today is. I don't think Scala's got to that point of critical mass where it's not going to be at risk of going away. Like, you look at Java. The only reason that Java will go away is eventually people will stop using it, like in you know 2050. Um, there will be some point when, frankly, there just aren't enough people using Java that you know that it starts really to wind down in terms of the support for it. But, I mean, obviously, it's not even a question. Regardless of the fact that Java is not cool and Scala is cool, there's no question that Java is going to be around and richly supported in 2020. It's not certain the same is true of Scala. I don't think we've gotten to that point. One of the reasons is that another reason that um, Java was successful is it actually happens to be pretty easy to write things that... Um, handle Java bytecode, I mean, writing a Java compiler, writing a good compiler is hard, but Java is a simple language in terms of the tool chain. Scala is not. It costs a great deal of money to deliver um, infrastructure around Scala, and this is one of the reasons that the tooling is actually not that good. Unless that tooling gets better, 
the future of Scala is not completely secure. So you know this is obviously a pretty pretty fundamental difference in um, opinion and emphasis. I think Scala is on a path to be extremely successful and to live a long time, but I don't think its future is assured in terms of sustaining and making worthwhile the expenditure of the many, many, many millions of dollars that need to be expended to make the Scala ecosystem truly robust. Um, okay, so um, mainstream, that's one of, the, one of the big points. Actually, Paul had a really interesting point about whether um, fragmentation of a community is a bad thing. And I think it's interesting to think about division versus fragmentation. I actually admit that C++ is an example I hadn't considered. It's a very good example. But I would describe that as division, not fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Division into two is OK. Fragmentation into 30 is bad. And rightly or wrongly, what I tend to see in some companies who have concern about the proliferation of Scala coding styles is they don't think it's fragmentation into two. They're not saying, you know, we've got um, the people who write code like this, and you know, they're not saying, for example, we've got the object people and the functional people. They're concerned that there is a great deal more inconsistency um, than that. I think they were the major issues that I wanted to um, make with respect to the other panelists. Um, I actually strongly agree with Paul's point that we do need to have new approaches because the problems are changing in enterprise or software or whatever you call it. There are clearly new classes of problems and I think Scala is at an exciting point where it is actually very suited to addressing some of them. Okay, with respect to Brian, um, actually the usual word here is whining, not whinging. Whinging is <laughs> the Australian word. Yeah. So I, I learned that when I, <laughs> when I first came here. Yeah, I need a translator. Yeah, I'm still not convinced that um, my talk was not either cohesive or coherent. I didn't think you made that case. Very strong um, disagreement, as I've said, about the issue of um, mainstream. But also, I'd really like to make a point about naive versus clever. It is to be simultaneously naive and clever. Indeed, it's quite easy. You can be clever at doing things that either don't matter or are not necessarily the right things. So naivety is partly a question of whether you're interested in doing the right things. Clever or not clever is in terms of how you do that thing. So for example, I'm actually sorry that I guess I did speak disrespectfully of a particular community member, but I happen to have a great deal of experience of relational databases. And saying that you can solve all the problems or something in one line of code, I think, I think that actually is a naive comment. I um, am sorry if I was not respectful about the individual, but I think that comment is naive. This is you are dealing with things that are very complex things. And it doesn't really matter how clever your algorithm is going to be. You are still, for example, going to find issues between um, the compatibility of and locking models and dialects supported, say, um, between MySQL and DB2 and Oracle that are really not about cleverness and not about elegance. The other point I think that is um, a strong point of difference between myself and Brian and also I think between myself and maybe some of the others on the panel, is that I do fundamentally believe if people, if people can't read your code easily, you shouldn't assume that the fault lies with them. Because you are imposing a tax on the reader. So for example, um, it may well be that if I read more of your code, I would learn. It's probably true. I'm yeah. sure I would learn more about functional programming. However, let's suppose that there exist people who are not as good programmers as you are. Should I read all their code as well? Should I put, put the time into reading code in the thought that it will educate me, when in many cases I'm going to read it and think, what the, what were they thinking? So, you know, I think that is frankly a little presumptuous to um, assume that we should require people to pay the tax. Now, I think Brian would probably argue that if you're not that familiar with functional programming, you should probably learn 
more about functional programming. And I actually completely agree. But I think this is a case where softly, softly catchy monkey. People will get that. So for example, Liddy referred to coming from a Java background. Presumably, she acquired more knowledge of functional programming. I think we may well all end up in a similar place. But I think people have different, pa um, different paces of getting that. One final point. I did not say that um, if you're a functional programmer, don't stay in Scala. What I said was, if you hate object-oriented programming, Scala is not the language for you. And I, I frankly stand by that comment. I think I find it very hard to understand why you would choose to use a language that is a hybrid if you hate object-oriented programming. And this is, I mean, this is literally what was on the slide. I said, if you hate object-oriented programming, Scala is not the language for you. I stand by that. Fair enough. Uh, and now uh, I think we'll just go in the same direction. So, Jorge, so this is your chance to basically ask the most important question of Rod to clarify your, uh, his position. So you get 30 seconds to ask the question. Uh, Jason, please uh, start the timer when each panelist starts the question. And then Rod has up to two minutes to respond to the question. Okay, Jorge, it's your turn. <sighs> Okay, so I think I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, do you think it is uh, it is better for, the, for Scala to be like a, a big tent community where we can have people who are basically writing Haskell that is pure functional programming, no object-oriented stuff, uh, you know, very much a certain style of programming in addition to people, you know, using it as a better Java? Uh, or do you think that the community should converge on a single style? That's a good point. I think that um, both things should happen to um, some degree. I think there clearly needs to be more consistency in terms of style guidelines. So I mean, actually, I think, interestingly, um, moving on from some of the comments that uh, Paul made, I think it might be interesting if there was a kind of coding standard for very functional Scala. And coding standard for like you know superior, not I mean not just better Java, but you know something that is more accessible to people um, coming predominantly from an object-oriented background. I think that there could be a case for two. Um, my issue is not with people who want to write functional Scala. My issue with people who regard non-purely functional Scala is degenerate because I don't think that really um, represents the nature of the language. So I think there should be a big tent, but you know what? There should be signs to a couple of important parts of the tent. It should be, you want to drink beer, um, you're a vegetarian, um, you want orange juice. You know, it would be nice to have those signs to the parts of the tent where people uh, congregate in coherent no in significant numbers. Thanks. I guess that means oh, it's oh. my turn. Yeah. Um, gosh, question. For, uh, that's. That's a that's a tough one. Do you think there might be some value in not expecting a new developer to Scala to be production quality productive on day one? Like, might it be worth an, an organization taking a month or two solely for training um, to try to help with that um, convergence of the, the developer community in an organization? Um, well, I would actually argue that the existence of one or at least a very small number of sets of coding standards would help with that process. Secondly, I relate it coming back to a point that James made. I don't think it's a one month process. I think we, whenever we go into a new programming language, we look at our code from not one month ago. We look at our code from six months ago, maybe from 15 months ago, and we think, oh, well, obviously, um, I could rewrite that in a much nicer way. So I think certainly, you know, certainly it is great to equip um, folk with a sense of a language as a new thing. So for example, if someone, say, comes from a Java background or from a Haskell background, it would be good if they don't try to treat Scala as you know, just different syntax for what they came from. But I think realistically, in a world where people get paid to deliver code, 
um, there are going to be a hell of a lot of people over the next few years who are not true Scala gurus, um, even if they're good programmers. And they're going to be writing code. And I think we, we need to accept that because you know, they, we don't have um, the luxury of a sufficiently extended education in all cases. Thanks. James? Uh, so I think my favorite thing about Scala uh, coming from an electrical engineering background, basically very little or no software engineering, uh, is that it's kind of opened my eyes to um, a lot of other paradigms and even other languages. So when I was learning Scala, um, you know, a lot of the, the concepts that I was reading about on blogs and so forth were written not in Scala but in Haskell or, or some kind of Lisp or something. And that kind of forced me to learn those languages, which like broaden my perspective even more. Um, so th I think that that experience is sort of my favorite aspect of Scala. Um, I wonder uh, what have you found to be the most uh, enjoyable part of learning Scala? I have found Scala to be a very um, rich experience in many ways. I think probably the biggest thing for me personally was that it wasn't since I was studying computer science 20 years ago that I had actually you know, done any serious functional programming. So for me, and I, I think that is true, for most people coming from a um, you know, similar background to where I was coming from, it's really going to be the functional um, aspects of Scala that are the, going to be the things that really make them think as programmers um, in a different way. I did? Yep. So my question's um, uh, related to so Java 8 coming up with um, Lambda expressions and things, um, and more of uh, support for functional style. How do you think um, it will impact the functional programming paradigm? Not specifically Scala, but just generally functional programming on its own. Do you, what kind of an impact do you think it will have? That's a um, really interesting point. I know that some people, um, even smart people whom I respect, um, actually seem a little pessimistic about the effect of um, Java 8 on Scala. Personally, I don't see it. I think, if anything, it will be a net positive for Scala um, for a couple of reasons. One is, and I mean, this is more personally my observation of how markets play out rather than the technical observation. When you have an incumbent, and you've got to challenge it. And the incumbent tries to add a feature that is a key selling point of the challenger. Basically, it means that the incumbent just massively validated the challenger. And also, they've got an implementation of that feature that you know, relatively sucks. So I think that it is a actually a pretty big validation for um, Scala. I think also that Java cannot do it as elegantly. I mean, one of the various reasons that Java can't do it so elegantly is everything in Scala is an expression. And that's just so beautiful when you're trying to um, move towards a functional paradigm. In Java, obviously, you can't go retrofit that. Uh, so you know, there are many reasons that I think that it won't um, be as elegant. However, I also think that it's a very good thing for Scala in that it may improve interoperability in certain areas. One example of that is ACA, where you know Paul mentioned some of the new uh, paradigms. Obviously, the actor model is very important in terms of the new paradigms that um, Scala facilitates. ACA will be a load more attractive to Java developers in Java 8. And you know that, I think, is going to make some of those people think, OK, great, I can adopt ACA now. But well, now I've adopted ACA, maybe I should check out the Scala thing and see whether it's actually nicer. So I think, I think it's goodness for, for uh, Scala. Thanks, Rob. So uh, with your talk, um, can you explain um, what your goals were for the talk? Uh, do you think you had the right audience? Do you think you achieved your goals? And would you feel comfortable with next Scala days having someone from Haskell come in and say, Scala is a functional language, we should be writing OO. Oh, sorry, we shouldn't be writing OO. And can you also answer a second question, which is, what is OO? I still don't know. Are there any other computer science questions you'd like me to, to ask me while I'm, while I'm at it? I think, I mean, frankly, the latter one, I think, is a little silly. I think that 
I and many of the people in this room understand object orientation and I, I honestly have been asked more times in my life by functional programmers than anyone else to define OO, which I find a little strange. Um, the goals for the talk and whether I realised those goals. The goals for the talk were partly around this issue of Scala coming to the mainstream, which, you know, profound difference of opinion here between certainly Brian and myself. Um, I think it's very, very important because Scala is something that I, I personally like, so self to endure a long term. And B, I think is so good that I would like as many people as possible to benefit from it. So, you know, one of my goals was actually to start a debate about how potentially Scala could um, get to the mainstream. Did I achieve those goals? Well, I think in fairness, I should point out that a significant majority of the people in the room actually gave the talk a standing ovation. So, so um, you know, I think that in terms of the goal of being s establishing debate, I think, I think that was successful. I think in terms of it was not one of my goals to foreclose the debate. So, for example, with respect to coding standards, I called for coding standards. I did not say this is the only way, you know, do what I say. This is the only way you can write, um, write Scala. With respect to a Haskell person coming in and telling people how to write Scala, I'd have no problem with that. I might learn from it. I, I personally would not be out there giving them a really hard time on Twitter. I'd be fine with it. So, Thanks, Rod. I would also add that we're here. If so, if the idea was to have a debate, I think we have an existence proof that it was successful. Absolutely, that goal has been achieved, and I think we all kind of move it forward. So uh, uh, I think it's, it's a great, great place to be. So uh, now in this next segment, uh, I was making notes, and uh, also I collated a lot of questions from the website. And by the way, Tony Morris, who is a revered <laughs> Uh, non-compromising functional programmer uh, who is uh, famous for basically never uh, giving an inch in uh, intellectual purity debate and being admirable for that. He actually submitted 20 questions, uh, which is the daily maximum for the meetup. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and we're very grateful to him because he voiced a lot of uh, sort of the, uh, I would say, extreme FP uh, uh, wing uh, uh, kind of for the debate opinion, uh, and uh, a lot of them are rhetorical. So, so I have essentially selected some themes uh, which uh, are, in my opinion, best uh, for every panelist. So I was just going to ask them in a kind of random order. Uh, so I want to start with Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little background. So um, uh, I've done actually uh, uh, large data uh, mining in several languages to compare. Uh, so uh, my research group at Dartmouth was one of the first users of the Twitter streaming API when it was created, and we uh, we was doing human behavior modeling in social networks, one of the first groups to do this at scale, and we created a huge Twitter graph by the stars of the day, maybe 5 million users, 100 million tweets, and uh, we uh, processed that graph in, in, in Haskell or Camel, Clojure and Scala, uh, and uh, and uh, basically to see which which of these languages is suitable for 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 industrial usage at, uh, at the scale, and we actually found that all of them are, but it, they require different effort. For instance, in Haskell, we discovered an integer overflow bar because not everybody actually tried Haskell at the scale, uh, and the garbage collector was overflown. Uh, but once they fixed it, it was performance-wise compatible with OCaml. Uh, and and uh, closure was surprisingly not that far off, maybe a factor of two, which was uh, three years ago, and they made large strides. And Scala obviously was was somewhere uh, uh, nearby uh, uh, Haskell and, and OCaml, uh, which had a tie. So uh, so I, I love Haskell, uh, and there is a lot of people whom I call crypto Haskellers, who who are basically Haskell people who found a job in Scala. So Scala gives a natural refuge to a lot of, of uh, Haskellers, uh, because that's, you know, it pays the bills, it's, it's widely adopted. Uh, and and uh, those folks are very comfortable exchanging type signatures in Haskell and reasoning in Haskell, and it gives you a compact language, right? Often, you know, uh, Scala has a lot of extraneous syntax and uh, type annotations and so forth. So uh, 
However, Haskell did not get that option, which Scala is getting. And, and uh, I'm not that great of a Haskeller, uh, but so I'm wondering, in your opinion, why, wh what makes Scala different? So, because we see already Scala is breaking out, as Rod said. So Scala, in some sense, is more complex than Haskell, because it has a lot of all thrown in and less consistency than Haskell, right? So, but for some reason, Scala is, is really being adopted, and uh, I'm curious, what is uh, your, uh, what makes it different from Haskell in, in, in your view? What, what Scala basically should do differently mm -hmm. from Haskell? And I know you don't care about mainstream, but you know, pretend you, you cared because it's, uh, what would Scala, like, what is this magical difference in Scala and how Scala community should, you know, enlarge it uh, to, 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 to get adoption? Okay. Um, so Scala is different in that a lot of people value the JVM. I, I don't personally value the JVM as much as what most people do, mm -hmm. um, but the JVM was a huge seller for uh, for, 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 for Scala, uh, made it accessible to a lot of people that were working in companies that already use the JVM. They could just easily put their code um, into production uh, without much pushback. Um, and also, uh, it is possible to write um, you know, Scala in a non-functional way, and a lot of people appreciate that. Um, I don't, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that, that's that's exactly why it's mainstream. Um, I I already believe Scala already is mainstream. Not that I care, but um, <laughs> it um, yeah, it's 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 mainstream because the JVM everyone was already able to publish code to it, and also because you were able to run write Java-ish code in Scala. Okay. So if we would, like if Haskell would be distributed as jars, essentially, uh, it probably would make a lot of... I'd, I'd expect things. more uptake in, in Haskell if you were able to publish that as a jar. Okay. No. I'd, I'd, I'd like more people to appreciate Haskell, but I don't... Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Yuri. We'll have uh, time for the audience questions. Uh, so... Yeah, uh, actually, if I can just make a point on that, I think the I actually am in strong agreement with Brian's answer, <laughs> um, and I think that we saw the same movie play out with C and C plus plus. Yeah, there were various languages that might have became popular, become popular, and C plus plus at that time won in terms of the next generation object oriented languages, and obviously there was a good deal of pain in that at first people wrote, um, you know. C, um, well, not even C with classes. They wrote um, C with slash slash comments. Um, <laughs> but in the end, people did actually learn how to write um, better C++. And the fact that there was that pathway that enabled a very large community to come on board, I think explained, uh, was a major reason for why C++ was so successful. I'm also very, very pleased that if that movie comes out, plays out again, Scala is actually much, much more elegant than C++. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and I, I would ask Paul to follow up on this because I know Paul has you, you worked with OCaml. Yes. A lot. So, and I think in, in some sense, OCaml's uh, is the even more niche. It's actually a very interesting language because it's very reliable. It's not moving fast as Haskell even. It's mm -hmm. not as fashionable as Haskell, right? So right. it's like a workhorse, but I found personal that if you need something done, you get 70% speed of C, and you get all the benefit of, of uh, uh, FP, right? And you get one package for each need, and it works, right? So you, like, you don't need to choose between JSON parsers. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it's still not, you know, it did not achieve, uh, you know, major adoption. So. Right. What's in your view the re like the key differences? Uh, what makes Scala better for you? Well, okay. Well, that's an easy one. Um, so I completely agree with Rod that the the value of the JVM from a mainstream perspective is is key, and strongly take his point that the ve the, the the quality of the JVM as we find it today. Um, is due to that popularity. Um, I have been around the Java world since 1.0. I remember complaining bitterly about the initial j garbage collector. Um, I remember complaining about the memory model uh, and so on. So um, all, all that I think is extremely well taken. Um, 
actually, it's interesting you bring this up because my reaction to Scala when I first heard about it was, oh, thank God, oh, Camel for the JVM. Um, and and um, that, that was, that was, I literally said that out loud. Uh, so um, it's not quite true. It's, it's not true in some ways that I think are an improvement on OCaml. Um, it's not true in some ways that I think are detrimental compared to OCaml. But one thing that I do take pleasure in pointing out is that OCaml and Scala are the two hybrid object-oriented functional programming languages to escape the lab. Um, in OCaml's case, we have the investment of Jane Street Capital and OCaml Pro uh, these days. There's, there's a new version of the language that just came out uh, literally within the past two days. Uh, it's going places in the niches that it occupies, um, and Scala is going places in the niches that it occupies. Um, I have mixed feelings about the popularity question, I have to be honest. Um, I, I tend to agree with the comments that, you know, if, if it becomes popular, I think that's great. If it doesn't become popular, it's not going to break my heart. Um, with that said, I also agree with Rod's comment that if you believe it's good technology, why wouldn't you promote it to, to more people? Why wouldn't you hope that it becomes popular? Um, the question I think that people struggle with is to what extent does that imply some sort of technological compromise? Um, and one of the things that I hope is that um, those of us who appreciate functional programming in particular um, can communicate the value of functional programming and communicate the meaning of the terminology in a not intimidating, not um, uh, condescending uh, kind of way. And, and I'll be the first person to admit that I don't always succeed at that myself. Okay. Uh, and question for Jorge. So I very much like the uh, idea of Scala tribes. So uh, I think Jorge formulated best. And uh, the, as I understand it, that Scala does not have to be uh, this uh, huge uh, homogeneous kind of uh, world that there are nature, there are different uh, mechanisms in the language that's big enough so different people can pick essentially different idioms or different subsets and and they can standardize in their community on uh, on what what works right and so so and I would assume that you know as let's say a company grows uh, the number of people increases and inevitably uh, the average level drops, right? Because like the more people you get, the more sort of average quality programmers you get, unfortunately. And uh, so, so my question is, you know, let's say, and I'm wondering how it works on, on Foursquare. So I would assume that early adopters are uh, uh, all these brilliant people who pick the technology for a reason, right? And then basically the, the initial tribe is very smart. And then they sort of grow and, and, and they expand and uh, essentially, uh, maybe not in the case of Foursquare, but LinkedIn, you, you either have already a bunch of Java programmers and you need to convert to Scala, or you start hiring Java programmers and training them because essentially you cannot hire Scala programmers at this point. You hire Java programmers or Ruby programmers and you train them. So what, how does this tribe model work dynamically uh, over the uh, course, you know, life cycle of a company? So <laughs> <laughs> so I think that um, uh, I think that within an organization, it's very important to be on the same page in terms of what kind of scholar code you're writing. Um, I, I think you know the, the the situations that I've heard about in which there is a company where there are people that believe that scholars should be written one way and people that believe scholars should be written another way. That I've never heard that end well. Um, so I think within an organization, you definitely have to standardize on like, you know, this is this is how we think Scala should be written, um, and we want to have a common standard. Um, but but I don't think that like everyone that writes Scala should should be on a common standard. I, I do think that uh, I, I think Rod, Rod's keynote uh, at Scala Days, he he sort of um, he said that Scala was a language in which you could write poetry, and and, and he compare that to Perl, and, and it was kind of like an implicit negative comparison. Um, but, but I think that's actually one of Scala's strengths. I think the reason that, uh, that both Rod and Tony Morris sort of like really, really like Scala and love using it uh, is because it's so flexible, right? Because it lets you, you know, sort of like take whatever your ideas about what good programming are and implement them in Scala. 
Um, and, and you know, these two people may not agree with each other on what those good ideas are, but uh, but Scala lets both of them sort of use the language to uh, to sort of like a, a satisfying uh, degree. Um, and so and so I think that's actually one of Scala's big strengths is that it's so flexible. Uh, but I also think it is it is a big challenge for Scala because it does mean that there are uh, communities with very different ideas about how code should be written. Um, and I think you know within a single open source project, within a single uh, a team in an organization, um, you you have to be on the same page or else you you can't you can't share a code base if you don't uh, if you don't share ideas about how code should be written. Uh, I think that's that's guaranteed to be a disaster. Alexi, can I make a comment? Of course. Um, I actually I really like this notion of potentially tribes or different different um, segments of the community with you know fairly consistent ways of doing things without within that segment um, of the community I mean I think actually in ret respect I probably um, starting to see on this panel that maybe I was a bit naive suggesting there should be one set of coding standards but let's suppose we have ten times as many people using Scala as we do right now which is seems pretty likely could we support say two or three different um, convention sets. Obviously, each of those convention sets would be more viable than the whole language is right now. So you know, I think that it would be great if we could get convergence around ways of doing things. I think division into major tribes is fine. I think it's consistent with um, the entire tent getting bigger. Fragmentation into loads and loads of different models that that honestly scares um, people I mean I I can't actually mention the company because I mean it it's I came um, to this knowledge through a business context rather than the technology context so I can't name them but their CTO wants to get rid of the Scala they're using and the reason he wants to get rid of it is because he's concerned uh, that in the long term it won't be maintainable because he's reviewed some of it and it seems extremely inconsistent. Mm -hmm. That scares people. Okay. I also should say, by the way, that I'm trying to persuade him not to. But <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, and I have a question about um, Scala adoption at, at Twitter. So, so Marius Eriksson is one of uh, advisors for, uh, for my company and uh, he's a principal engineer at Twitter. He wrote this document called Effective Scala. Right, and, and uh, uh, basically, uh, which, which is uh, a coding convention style. Uh, and uh, I wonder, in your practice, how do you see that working, actually? Right, so there is this document, how does the adoption, how does Effective Scala document get uh, implemented? How do you go about code reviews? Do you see people picking up and sort of, uh, uh, Basically, diversion from it up or down, right? Like because obviously some some people will be very good at it and will probably want to do more stuff. And how does Twitter react to that as an organization to enforce this standard essentially? Right. So I can speak specifically at Twitter how we do this. Um, as soon as um, we have an engineer who comes on board who wants to learn Scala or work in Scala, there's basically guidelines around this. So review boards, um, we basically use review board for all our reviewing sy systems. And um, you have owners added to all code bases who are actually um, engineers who are across effective Scala and they know the coding standards, everything is documented. Mm -hmm. So basically it's a guideline around how you should do things. Things like a line shouldn't have more than 100 characters in it to um, um, different so sorts of standards in there. Um, but it all boils back down to having leads who can actually take ownership of the code base and say that this is the right way of moving forward. This is what Scala School has in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, basically telling people what would be the best way of doing this. It's enforced upon your, your, um, using the review cycles. There's also design reviews that happen on each of the systems that we build. And we ensure that everything is held up to standards and the guidelines that are specified. So would you say it actually succeeds? So do you see the code base as a result of it conforming to the standards? Um, I would say it succeeds 
most of the time. I wouldn't say 100% of the time because there are always glitches. Um, but I do realize when I see Scala code at Twitter, um, it's much easier to read. I understand what's going on. I've seen Scala's um, code outside of Twitter, and it's uh, definitely a havoc at times to read that. So um, it's like uh, going back to what you were saying about being in the same company, being in the same team, you need to be on the same page. It develops a notion of uh, unanimity within as well. As soon as you go out, it's harder to maintain that discipline, but there definitely should be guidelines around it. Thanks. Uh, question for James. So uh, James, uh, you had a lot of experience with Spring before you uh, went to Scala, and Spring undoubtedly uh, added huge business value to Java World, right? So basically, it, it enabled enterprise in, in, in multiple ways, and uh, I think we're all here uh, in San Francisco in, in various businesses, uh, which uh, a lot of them work on JVM, so this is uh, definitely a very practical and important concern. So uh, what can we learn from success of Spring, in your opinion, technologically and, and business-like, right? So there is something about Spring, on two levels, right? And some, uh, it catches the attention of a developer, which enables the developer to do new things. It becomes this kind of glue in the enterprise, and, and it becomes uh, uh, basically uh, uh, business-wise a successful technology. What, what essentially makes it, in your view, a uh, successful business-like technology? What can we do in Scala, or with Scala as a whole, or subsets of Scala to basically replicate that? Uh, wow, that's kind of a big question. Uh, so <laughs> when I used Spring, um, it was it rescued me from EJB, which was awesome at the time, and it was also a major source for me uh, uh, of learning. Uh, you know, looking through the source, I actually the the first time I ever interacted with Spring, I was on a team uh, uh, of engineers, and the the engineering lead said, "Okay, here's Spring. You need to learn how to use this." and and you know, start working on the code base. So a couple of weeks later, I had kind of a, a vague idea of how to use Spring, and and you know, had another meeting with my lead, and he said, you know, how you're coming along? How do you like Spring so far? And I said, yeah, you know, it seems to be cool. Like, can put stuff together pretty easily. Uh, and and he said, okay, your next step is to look at the source and tell me how Spring works. So he he it, uh, that encouragement to go and like dive deep and really understand how uh, how it worked encouraged me to get into open source and learn like how other people are programming um, outside of the teams that I knew. I was very junior at this point. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I, I grew with Spring. This was back in the 2.0 days, I think. And you know, I followed it through uh, to 3.0. Um, so, uh, and I even uh, wrote a short uh, book on Spring MVC uh, uh, several years ago. And uh, so for me, Spring was a huge tool in my toolbox to whack out you know, enterprise-y type Java applications uh, and, um, and do dependency injection and ORM in combination with Hibernate uh, and um, uh, Spring integration, connecting to queues and things, uh, also popular Apache Camel in that space. Uh, so like all of these tools were very good uh, at the time um, because they, they solved all of the needs of sort of the infrastructure and the plumbing and the, the stuff that wasn't domain specific uh, to the problems that needed to be solved. Um, it, but actually now with Scala, I find I haven't needed to pull uh, any of those tools uh, yet. You know, I haven't, I haven't worked on a breadth of, of uh, problems that I did, you know, uh, because I'm still fairly new to Scala. But uh, as far as the major ones like dependency injection and ORM, uh, I, I have found that the, the features of Scala itself uh, sort of supersede the need for um, those types of features on a library level. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, there are many ways to do dependency injection. Um, cake pattern is one of the first ones that we learn and uh, graduate to the reader monad. Um, in ORM, uh, I I found that you know direct SQL manipulation um, has actually been uh, uh, easier for me to do because I can combine it with these other functional patterns. Um, uh, uh, again, reader monad or or, or similar um, patterns. So, I think, f at least for me, Spring um, was extremely useful for building enterprise applications. Um, but maybe more so, it was useful for 
that kind of community involvement and um, pushing myself beyond my comfort level with regard to how I learned how to code. And with Scala, it's kind of the same thing, except it's happening at the language level rather than a library level. Okay. Uh, and uh, my last question of the segment is for Rod, but before I ask it, I actually want to ask the audience uh, to raise your hands if you are in a startup. All right, cool. Now, out of this, if you are on JVM. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There is a limit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have to look at Twitter. Apologize for the inconvenience. <laughs> so, so okay. So I've seen a bunch of uh, hands uh, of guys on startups, and uh, before SF Scala, I actually founded this uh, meetup called Scala for Startups because every other meetup in the city was dormant, and then later we merged it with SF Scala, and basically uh, we grew it from zero to about 600 uh, members in 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 about a year and a half. And we've seen a lot, a lot of companies coming into Scala in the startup space specifically. And uh, one of the reasons is that you can do more with less people. But if you have very high quality people, you can actually do a lot more. Uh, and we've seen company after company join the space. And now we're at the point where actually new companies are moving into Soma, specifically for the purpose of hiring Scala programmers or you know basically finding training others but finding good programmers and they actually want to host our meetup so so it's 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 amazing kabam is a great example right so uh, folks are picking it up and they find it useful so in your keynote you said that that startups are not uh, as you know as 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 uh, enjoying as much enjoying scala as, as, as the enterprise and uh, I, I don't have much enterprise experience so in my view that that i mean the 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 response to scala uh, is amazing so uh so I would ask you, how do you see, uh, from your experience, the difference between enterprise and startups? What are sort of the key characteristics of each? And and if uh, if we want to get more startups on onto uh, Scala as opposed to Node or Ruby, uh, basically, how do we uh, make an argument to the startups that that Scala is good for them? Um, well, firstly, I, I think it's fair to say that I've since learnt that there was more um, startup usage of Scala than I knew. So, you know, I am frequently wrong. And when I'm wrong, I don't have a problem admitting it. So, um, I think if you look at where Scala is used, it's really pretty interesting in that it seems to be a mix. There's startup folk and there is also the enterprise or whatever you want to call it. I mean. You know, there is there is no question that Scala is very strong in um, the so-called enterprise space. In terms of how Scala should appeal to um, startups, I think Scala should fundamentally appeal it's, it's to people nice by question. being a really good language, That's and I think it does that. I I don't know that it's like you know um, Scala doesn't have to you know wear lipstick in a tiara to appear appeal to people. I mean Scala is a uh, pretty attractive um, thing. Uh, so, you know, I think that one of the key um, things that I think would be helpful um, would be probably greater guidance in terms of getting started. I think, I think that for pretty much all the audiences that are likely to consume uh, Scala, I uh, think that's um, very important. But I actually, frankly, don't think that, I think another thing that isn't necessarily going to be helpful appealing to startups, along with the lipstick and the tiara, is the language progressing incredibly fast. I, I actually personally don't think that Scala needs an enormous rapidity of new features coming into the language to be appealing to startups or anyone else. Because, I mean, if you look, the fundamental problem, and I think this has come, or not a, the problem, the fundamental question with Scala is how do you understand, how do you learn how to get the most out of Scala? Um, like, you know, I think all of us on this panel are at different places with that. I mean, I, I think I'm probably the least far along in terms of learning. Um, but Scala is a very rich thing where, 
you know, we don't need a constant stream of new features that potentially make the whole thing a moving target for tool chain and even for adoption. I think there's actually this processing that we all need to do as programmers where we actually realize, wow, now you can do this. Uh, that, you know, Scala gives us um, some great, well, I almost said some great options and then realized it was a pun. So. Thanks. Uh, so this is now time for the audience questions. So I will ask Mike to uh, bring the microphone to our members. And you can, you can address the panel in general. And then whoever wants to pick the question can jump on it and others can follow up. Or you can address a specific uh, panel member if you have a question for them. OK. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you for the uh, discussion. It was great. I want to get back to the question of code readability and elegance versus naivety versus cleverness, et cetera. It seems to me that that's kind of dancing around. That debate dances around a more fundamental question, which is this. Is it possible that Scala is such a sophisticated language that in order for it to be readable, you have to dumb it down a little bit? And if that's the case, does it also follow that as the adoption expands and more of the unwashed masses come in, we have to dumb it down further in order to maintain uh, code readability. And I, that's a question. That's not a statement. I, I, I really want to know your views on that. Can I respond to that sure. initially? Um, I think it's a really good question. I think, frankly, as any technology becomes widely adopted, there are going to be smart people that come into it. There are going to be people who are less smart. And the people who are less smart are going to do bad things. So, you know, frankly, with respect to Spring, you know, I mean, I missed the bit where I told people that they could not use new when they had the Spring container. I don't know, maybe people thought I said it. But, you know, I would actually see these bizarre things in customer um, interactions where, you know, people are using the Spring container in places where I never would have used it. Um, so, you know, if you have a technology that's going to be very widely adopted, people are going to do horrible things. And some of the people who do horrible things are going to cause people to make comments about the technology that may or may not uh, be fair. In the case of Scala, it's a really interesting question because Scala is elegant and I think very well put together. So I'd really struggle to think about the core language if I wanted to dumb it down to make it more accessible. I'm not sure what I'd take out because it, it just, you know, it, there's such a fabulously neat job of making things um, work together. So frankly, I think it's an education problem. I think it's an education and guidance problem. It's not a problem uh, with the language. I'd actually like to respond to that as well. Um, an argument that I like to make about Scala as a language design is that it is an extremely orthogonal language design, and Rod alluded to that. What I mean by that is um, one of its design principles is that you can declare nearly anything in any context. There aren't a lot of special cases. There aren't a lot of corner cases. One of the implications of that that may be those of us who are fans of Scala don't articulate very well, is that that means that rather than forcing your design of your software to conform to some preconceived notion on the part of the language designer, um, you have more flexibility as an application designer as to how you use the language features to get the job done. One way to express that is there are too many ways to do the same thing. And you can, you can make that point, you can make that argument, but what I would argue in return is that that means that your application design's constraints in any given part of your application are going to derive from how the rest of your application is designed rather than from constraints that are imposed on you by the language. And that's a challenge. That's where a lot of the complaints about Scala's complexity, in my opinion, come from, is this flexibility. This, the requirement is now on you to design your application in a consistent way throughout your code base, as opposed to having to conform to what the language insists you do. Thanks, Paul. I have kind of a rhetorical follow-up, um, because I don't know, uh, there's not really an answer that I know of. But uh, I think if we, if we think about the eventual mass adoption of Scala and more people from different backgrounds coming in and wanting to get to a common place uh, where kind of everybody can read the code uh, or everybody can get to 
the place they need to go to read the code um, and kind of have this convergence in style. Uh, I wonder if that might be self-defeating because, uh, I mean, just on this panel, we have, oh, it's OCaml on the JVM, or, or I come from Haskell and I can write in this language, or I come from Java and I can, you know, it's, it's Java without the semicolons, and then, you know, I learned the other way. <laughs> well, not always. There's a theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, so anyway, I wonder if, if we remove some of those uh, openings, would that be self-defeating in, in sort of our progression toward adoption? I don't know. Can I just comment on readability for a second? Um, so a lot of people, when they say readability, they mean it doesn't use symbols. It only uses letters. Um, I, I completely reject that. The only thing that I find readable is when you only use values. Once you start putting side effects in there, I can't figure out what the hell you're doing. If you only use values, it's easy. I just read, what, 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 what does that value mean? What, what, does this, what, what does this value represent? I'm set. I can figure out any code if you use just values. Uh, another question? Great. Let's try to keep the questions to questions and not uh, hour-long statements. <laughs> uh, OK, I'll try uh, to not make long statements. I'll make a short statement. So work on Scala compiler. It's really cool to be here and see so many people excited about Scala. So thank you. Makes my every day better when I struggle with compiler performance. That's my topic. Um, so I have a question about like the slowing down with features and you know making it easier for tools ca to catch up and for people also to catch up with the language. So there is this uh, issue that you know Scala is coming from research. For, for many years it was like people were free to add new things to Scala, try new ideas, and now we have a product which we are all excited about. So is, for example, Rod, do you argue that we are like, we're basically, is Scala going to be following the same um, cycle where you innovate really quickly, then you slow down, you peak, and then you die? And, um, and do you want to push us more into like, peak uh, territory and, and less into innovative territory. Or you could like widen uh, the gap, like the, make it longer that we still innovate and you know, and we have adoption at the same time by making may maybe like some new ways to uh, introduce new features in less painful way, for example. Uh, interesting uh, question. I would come back to the point that I previously made that I do think there is a very significant backlog log in terms of most people in the community, um, including even advanced users and certainly including less advanced users like myself. There is a backlog of work in figuring out how to work, you know, how to really get your head around what's already there. And to me, that Priority one is stabilizing the tool chain and um, achieving education. And that's more important than adding more features that actually make the tool chain more problematic and make the education uh, challenge um, bigger. I certainly would not want Scala to cease to innovate. Um, but I think realistically, we've got to look at the fact that Scala's done a whole lot of innovation. Now we've got a lot of people knocking at the door and they want to come in. And imagine that room, you know, the chairs, some of them, the legs on the chairs are a bit wobbly. Um, you know, they might try to, um, they might um, try to put their drink down and find the table falls over. They might actually slip in um, some of the um, spillage on the floor. And this is a dangerous time, I think, for the focus to be Oh, let's let's enlarge the room. Let's bring more people into the. Let's um, you know make the room essentially more complex. Let's bring more wobbly furniture into the room. I would actually rather say, okay, it's wonderful that these people are coming in. Let's just make sure that they really really enjoy the experience. And guess what? When they're in the room, um, then they're going to say, oh, we really like this room. You got any more rooms for us? Can you build us another room? So, you know, I, I think there is a balance. I would hate to see Scala become um, somewhere there wasn't innovation. But, you know, frankly, particularly if you look at the Java audience, which is going to be the biggest audience that's going to come to Scala, you know, these, it's like a, being a kid in a candy shop. You look at all this new goodness. You don't say, 
hmm, you don't have enough new goodness. Hmm. If, if I could un underscore that very quickly, let me just remind everyone in the room that Scala 2.10.2 is a statically typed, hybrid, object-oriented, functional programming language with dependent types and delimited continuation. <laughs> what do you people want? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot macros. Uh, macros! <laughs> That's right. Oh, I would actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I want to jump in on the on the features uh, discussion a little bit. Um, so I kind of agree with Greg. I think uh, like Java changed basically not at all from from Java five, which came out ten years ago, to until like basically Java eight, where they're like finally adding a bunch of stuff to the language. Um, and I think there was a lot of real stagnation in, in in the language and in the ecosystem. And if you compare it to like the the enterprise competitor, if you compare it to C sharp uh, and and the CLR, uh, Microsoft. You know, innovated a lot in in terms of language design, in terms of VM, um, and and there are a lot of features in C Sharp that Java doesn't have, and it can, you know, in terms of memory management, in terms of integrating with native code, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, variance annotations. There's there's just a lot of stuff. Uh, like C Sharp is a huge language, and it has a lot of features, um, and, and a lot of times it's because they were. Uh, necessary to do things for real work, right? Like if you if you want to interop with a, a C++ native API, uh, which is you know pretty much necessary if you're building native Windows apps, um, you can't do it with with a model like what the JVM does. It's just like a very poor way of of interfacing with native code. Um, and and so I I kind of agree with Greg a little bit that that sort of like freezing Scala, um, and, and a lot of this is like you know, the JVM needs to evolve as well, and it's not just the language. Um, but, but I think that, that freezing, freezing Scala and freezing the JVM at where they are now is not necessarily the, the, the best move. Um, I, think, I think in terms of like core language features, right, in terms of like, like stuff like macros and delimited continuations and things like that, uh, I, I would agree with like slowing things down. But, um, but in, terms of, in, in terms of like developing the language and adding features that let you do things that are not possible right now, um, uh, like the dynamic type and, and all this stuff. Uh, I think you know they can be features which are sort of like limited to a particular use case and are not going to affect the day-to-day -day programming of the majority of programmers. Uh, but that when you do need them, they're there and you can use them and they're useful. Um, and I think that's important. Uh, and, and so I wouldn't want to see Scala sort of like stagnate for 10 years like, like Java did, even though I do agree that the, the tool chain, uh, tooling needs to improve quite a bit. I think there's, I mean, frankly, I would say that Java, completely agree. Um, Java went through a period where it evolved way too slowly and that hurt it. I think Scala is evolving too fast. So I think, you know, somewhere between the two lies a sweet spot and I would really like us to try to find that sweet spot rather, rather than just assume that you just throw things in, you throw things in. So. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Hi. Um, first, small comment to Brian. Um, I can sort of feel your pain as far as wide adoption. Uh, about 13, 14 years ago, I went from C++ to Java, and I was resentful. In C++, it was hard, and I was really good at it, and I had a competitive edge. Now, the mass of people would be able to do the same thing in Java much simpler and easier, and I was really resentful. And it's, I, I, I sort of understand. But okay. at this point, I, am, I need to hire people, and I want Scala to be easier because I need people to do it with me, and I don't want to go back to Java so I can uh, work with them. I want it the other way around. And, and, and so <laughs> it's a slightly different <clears throat> viewpoint. Um, question, uh, as far as the language complexity or um, style, I just recently went to Scala, less than a year ago, maybe six, seven months. And what I found difficult was I didn't find a single language to, to learn. It was more like because you can do DSLs, and it was like a bunch of languages that you have to, you look at this library, they have their own um, operators maybe, but that's not the main thing. There's a different things you look at and they look, it's not a single language like, like Java is, it's like many different things because of the different libraries you look at. Could you comment on that please, Rob? Scala doesn't have operators. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my, that's my, yeah. that's, yeah. that's yeah. my, yeah, I do know what you mean. That's my, that's my number one, but that is my number one gripe with that, with that complaint. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah they're, they're, uh, they're just methods. Uh, and, and let me tell you what the difference is, because this is very important. In a language that actually has operators, you have no way of knowing what an operator does other than to know that operator. In a language that doesn't have operators, but that just has a dot inference, it's not an operator, it's just a method on the object to the left, or if it ends with a colon, the object to the right, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but what that means is, with proper tooling, you can say, please look up the definition of this method, right, on this class, or on this object, or what have you. That's a huge difference. And this is why every time somebody complains about overloaded operators in Scala, I say, Scala doesn't have operators. Uh, I understand. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. I think it actually is a very fascinating new direction, talking about practice and theory. I mean, obviously, <laughs> Paul is completely right in theory, but it was an interesting um, interaction. Uh, so, well, firstly, in terms of my personal usage, I must admit I've actually backed off. When I first got into Scala, I actually created DSL for this, DSL for that. And I've personally backed off a bit and I've decided, ended up just doing, creating the DSL only when I really, really understand the problem and when, frankly, the DSL makes the problem so much simpler. I, don't, I no longer do it just for cosmetics. I mean, you know, that's just my personal practice. I, um, wouldn't necessarily advance that as the best practice. I think it all, to me, comes down to some degree of consistency in education. So, yes, if you create a DSL, so if instead of, you know, designing anything that resembles an API, everything is like your DSL style and it requires learning it um, on the part of readers, I think that's problematic. But on the other hand, like, if you use DSLs appropriately for things that they simplify in Scala, you know, you can't read the Java code and the builders and the various other ways that you would do that. So, I mean, again, I think it's one of those things, like as I said, um, one of the things that caused um, some people to um, form a negative view of Spring is they looked at code bases where every single thing was injected, even when it didn't need to be. So, you know, again, it, dependency injection um, in, at least in its intended context, is a very val valuable thing. But you didn't need to use it everywhere. And I think if you look at DSLs used appropriately, personally, I wouldn't want to live without that because it's very, very elegant. Emphasize the D rather than the L. Uh, I, th I, think, yeah. I think another thing with DSLs and, yeah. and Scala is that, um, I mean, I think 80% of the time your library should be just a library and it shouldn't look like a DSL. Uh, but 20% of the time, having a DSL is great, right? Like parser combinators, you know, I just ragged on how there's six different JSON parsers. <laughs> and the reason is because it's so cool to write a parser in Scala <laughs> because you write this, you know, grammar and it's executable and it parses your language and it's fantastic. Uh, but, but I think the flip side to that is that um, DSLs are very poorly served by the way in which we write documentation for Java libraries and for Scala libraries, right? Like, like tools like Javadoc and Scaladoc are meant for libraries; they're not meant for DSLs. Yeah. Um, and so I think it, I think there's there's sort of like a challenge there for um, for, for for someone to figure out like how do you uh, how do you write better documentation for something that's, that's more a DSL than it is a library? Um, and I don't think we've we've really figured that out yet. And it, and it matters a lot whether you know the D. I mean, people, it's like, if you can't read the code, is that because you, the DSL is bad, or is it because you're not familiar with what the D is about? Take a look at Spray, you know? If, if you're writing REST APIs in Scala, please take a look at Spray, because I think it's a really good example of a finely tuned DSL for handling HTTP requests easily, right? Uh, thanks, Paul. So uh, we uh, don't have the time for the uh, hashtag questions. So uh, hopefully we can actually continue this uh, discussion on Twitter and elsewhere. But I wanted, in closing, to ask each of you guys, in turn, to make a prediction. So maybe Jason will do uh, 30 seconds for each person. So I have basically a very simple question for each of you. Where do you think Scala is going to be in 2018? Mm. Is it going to be as big as Java? Is it going to overcome Java? Uh, and uh, how uh, 
do you think community will look like? Will it be a set of tribes? Will it be kind of a simplified effective scala like version? So basically, 30 seconds for the prediction of the future. Starts with Jorge. Oh boy. <laughs> um, I th so I, I I actually don't think that that Scala will be as popular as Java. Um, I, I part of me doesn't want it to, and part of me doesn't think it will be. Uh, excuse me, can I interrupt that just to have a? I really need to go to the sure. restroom. I'm, so, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thirty seconds. <laughs> Reality strikes. <laughs> Um, so, so I, I, I want and I hope Scala to be much more popular than it is now, but I, I, I don't think it will be as popular as Java. Uh, but I think it will still have sort of like a, a vibrant, thriving ecosystem of people that use it to do uh, real productive work and people that use it to do uh, sort of like crazy academic work. And I, and I think there will be like a big tent of Scala users that, uh, that look at Scala very differently. But um, I think it will be much more successful than it is now, but I don't think it will be as successful as Java. Thanks. Uh, just let's do a minute, I think, per person. Paul, it's your turn. Yeah. Um, 2018. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident Scala will still be with us. Um, I, I don't think it will be as, as popular as, as Java. Um, I don't care that much, but I don't think it will be as popular as Java. I think there will be a lo fairly large community of people who kind of use Shapeless every day without thinking about it and who still think that Scala Z is just madness. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, well, yeah, I agree. Um, uh, I don't have much to add other than I, I think we're seeing a lot of people in the Scala community branch out and look at implementing other languages on the JVM, or Mine, and Friga, uh, and some others. Um, so who knows? Maybe some of the community who's not completely satisfied with um, some of the decisions uh, being made in Scala, SIP 18, for example, uh, might you know, leave. Um, but then again, they might go and do other things that then inspire Scala to grow. So uh, I, I don't think Scala is going away. Uh, I don't think it will be as popular as Java, but uh, I think there's uh, going to be some very interesting time. debate for the next five years. I think um, Scala definitely has the potential to be a very mainstream language by the time 2018 comes around. Um, and it's will all depend on how the next five years pan out. Um, I don't personally think it will be as popular as Java, but it is on the JVM, so it has that advantage. Um, I also think the Scala community, that you will always have different tribes, people who believe in different things or and who have different opinions. So you might get um, two or three or more different camps, but I think there will be homogeneity within those camps. So um, it will be a popular language used in mainstream by 2018. Thanks. Um, so I know there's quite a few people that are like me that are that are happy that Scala is around and that it's capable enough for us to do functional programming with. But I do believe by 2018 there will be other functional programming languages for the JVM. Um, I think that a lot of people that feel dissatisfied with parts of Scala uh, will move over to there. Uh, move over to other functional languages on the JVM. And I hope that makes Rod happy with his um, uh, telling everyone to go away if they don't believe in OO. All right, so it's just in time to make a prediction for the 2018. <laughs> and uh, is Scala going to be as big as Java or uh, overcome it? And what set of tribes or kind of community it, lo it will look like? Um, well, I'm very sorry that, sincerely, that I didn't hear um, Brian's okay. answer in particular. Um, <laughs> it was a good one. Um, but honestly, I think I pretty much uh, stand by my prediction that Scala is going to be a very big language. It is not going to be as big as Java because we're no longer going to see that virtual monoculture that Java achieved. That's a good thing. So, you know, I don't think Scala is going to be the thing that everybody has to write everything in. And that's just fine, because it's not really healthy uh, when that happens. I think uh, Scala will probably be particularly strong in the um, enterprise space. I do think that Scala is going to be predominantly with more experience programmers. I, I certainly 
fundamentally agree that Scala is well suited um, to highly skilled people, but I also think that there are actually quite a lot of really smart, highly skilled people, particularly you know, when we think about India, China, there are a lot of smart people um, who are coming um, into software and I think hopefully Scala will provide a home for very, very many of them. I think that for Scala to have gotten there, we will have a degree of convergence in what Scala should look like. And I think, frankly, if you look at Java, there, even though Java was relatively simple as a language, there could have been more inconsistency in Java than there, than there was. For example, people were remarkably consistent about capitalization in Java. It was the first language I'd worked in where suddenly everyone used the same convention rather than you know, fighting to the death over different conventions. And that definitely benefited Java. I mean, honestly, it was one of those things, no, don't argue about it and make it a matter of life and death. Just accept whatever it is, camel case, it doesn't matter. It is better to standardize on something that makes it easier for people to read each other's code. So I would very much expect that Scala will have, um, you know, gathered around maybe one or two principal um, way of doing things. I would hope by then that Scala tooling is absolutely awesome because, you know, technically um, there is no reason that it should not be. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. And what I suggest we do, let's reconvene this panel again in 2018 and go back and see what happened. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks to the audience. It was a long panel, but I think it was really enjoyable. So I appreciate everybody uh, joining and uh, Kabam for hosting. And I think there is some uh, pizza and beer still left. Let's have a hand for all the participants, please. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. There's still a whole pile of pizza, and there's still beer in the kegs. Feel free to grab at least one more. I know lots of you have burning questions that remain.